we join together by praying to that prayer that our Father, our Jesus, taught his disciples to pray. Pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, this morning's scripture reading you can see on your bulletin comes from two places. The first one is from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear the word of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10. You see in the bulletin verses 28 through 31, but I'm going to go ahead and read for all of you the, more, the, the entire passage uh, because uh, it, it's what we've been looking at uh, before Christmas and, and the Christmas season and New Year's type messages. Prior to that, if you remember, we were right here in Mark chapter 10 looking at three questions Today, we're coming back to it the completed by looking at the final question. So I'm going to read the entire selection for us, but the part that we're going to focus on is what's on the bulletin, verses 28 through 31. But let me read it all for us so that we know the context. This is the account, of course, of the rich young ruler coming to talk to Jesus. Here's the word of God. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Hey, honor your father and mother. But he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now at this time, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. 
This ends the reading of God's holy word. Blessed is the one who hears it and keeps it. Well, as I said, we're back in Mark chapter, seven, uh, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31, and we're finishing up what we started a few weeks ago. And what we've been doing is looking at these lessons that are taught in this passage around three questions. If you remember, the first question is this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We talked about that. And if you recall, when you were here, we dealt with the second one, which is, then who can be saved? Right? And now today we're going to look at the last one, which is Peter speaking, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? This, by the way, this question is not found in Mark's account. If you're paying attention, there's no question there. It's actually taking this account, the same account. Mark does not record the question, but Matthew's gospel does. So I'm combining the two to see the question which again is, uh, what then will we have? Remember this core truth that's, that is all around these three questions. Remember this truth, and that is this, that only in Jesus Christ will you find eternal life and a satisfying life. And that is the core truth that is being taught here, and it's revolving around the three questions. It's unveiled by the questions. Okay. So Peter, so we're dealing with this last one today. Peter contrasts himself and the disciples with, with the rich young ruler, the, the, the rich young guy. By, because the rich young guy, what did he do? When Jesus confronted him with the truth, what did he do? He left sad because he had many possessions. He wanted to hold on to the world. He wanted to hold on to his possessions. But Peter says, hey, Jesus, we're not like that guy. We have left everything and followed you, unlike that guy. So, so, what's in it for us? What's going to happen to us? Because we, we know it's going to happen to him. He's not following you. But what about us? We did follow you. So there's the issue. There's the question. And so he's basically saying something like, um, hey, I, we, we are not people who started to go to church and then one year later just stopped and stopped going to church altogether. Or, hey, I went to a spiritual retreat to a camp, but when I got back home, I just forgot everything and went right back to living the way I've always lived. Or, or, or saying something like, hey, uh, I went on a mission trip to serve you, God, uh, for two weeks straight. But when I got back home, eh, I forgot everything and just went back to status routine. And I don't really care anymore. Peter is saying, that's not us. We didn't do that. When we committed to you, we have stayed committed to you. We have abandoned the whole world and are following you, staking our lives on you. Because we believe you are God. So, Lord, what's going to happen to us? Because we're not unfaithful like some other people. We have stuck it out. So Jesus answers him. And it's pretty, pretty compelling what he says. Jesus uh, answers by promising to Peter and to anyone who follows him, that's you. Pay attention. And you guys in there, that's you if you're listening. That's you. If you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior and you say you follow him, pay attention. He's talking to you. And here's what he's got to say. He says, okay, anyone who follows me can expect three things. Peter, and here they are. Number one, a hundredfold blessing in this life. Okay? Number two, persecutions. That doesn't, that, that doesn't sound too thrilling, but that's what he says. That when you live a faithful, godly life for me, people ain't going to like it. And they're going to come after you, and you'll be persecuted. But then there's a number three, and that is ultimately you have eternal life. When this life is done, I will give you eternal life. Okay. So I think we get number two and number three and talk about that quite a bit. So I'm going to park those for today, but it's number one. 
that should grab your attention. What does he mean by that? And, and, and it says again, uh, well, let me read it for us in verses 29 through 30. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Million dollar question, what is he talking about? What's he talking about? Does he mean that if you give up a house to follow me, I'm going to give you a hundred more? Really? If you leave your mama to follow me as the priority, I'm going to give you a hundred more mamas. Is that what he's really literally talking about? Of course not. Of course not. So what is he talking about? Here's what he's saying, guys. And listen very carefully. Ultimately, what he means is that the things of God, the things that God will give you in this life, in this life, are going to be better and more satisfying than those things you thought would satisfy you or fulfill you. So look at it this way. Hey, I'm not throwing my mother overboard, but God has now become the primary relationship in my life, or my father. God has become the primary relationship in my life while I try to honor my father and mother but I'm not going to forsake God in order to please dad and mom number one. And what he's saying is because of that, because you follow me, that, that, that relationship you enjoy with your parents, you're going to get something. I can't, I can't imagine that. So that doesn't sound like heaven to me. But here's, here's what they have to realize and what you tell them is actually what the Bible is teaching is even though the institution of marriage will end, your relationship to your current spouse, if you're both following Christ and are in heaven, will be very intimate, more intimate than what you enjoy in this institution of marriage, and there will be no sin to hinder your relationship. You guys actually will be more in love and closer to each other, minus the institution of marriage, in heaven than you do now, that you experience now. And it just goes, boom. It blows the mind to think about. And they become happy. And go, wow, that does sound like an incredible thing. That does sound like heaven. But, it, but it's so hard to wrap the mind around. And that, in a similar way, in a similar way, is what Jesus is saying. So he's saying, look, guys, you think this is wonderful, and it is. Marriage is a wonderful thing. Children are a wonderful thing, but I'm telling you, you follow me and put me first, follow me as God, do not put your marriage as your God, do not put another human being as your God, I am God, then what, then what, happens, then what happens is you're going to enjoy something far richer and deeper than what you thought you would. That's what this is saying, and I hope you guys see that. All right, let's use money. Let's use money as an example. Having money does help in this life, right? We all know that. <laughs> money does help. Okay, you can't avoid money. You gotta have it in this world. Okay, uh, some have it more than others, but that's just the way it is. Uh, but we also all know that money's ability to make you actually satisfied and happy is very limited, right? Think about it this way. Somebody once wrote the following: Money will buy you a bed. Where is he? But it won't buy you sleep. Get that? Money, money will buy you food, but it will not give you an appetite. Money will buy you medicine, but it will not be your ultimate health. Money will buy a house, but it will not buy a home. Money will buy you a diamond, but it can't buy you love. Money will buy a church pew, but it cannot buy salvation. And so we see the limitations of what it can do, and what Christ is saying again to Peter and all who listen, that you follow me, and you will experience a hundredfold what you thought those things would do for you, you will experience more in me a richer and deeper satisfaction. You're going to get more than what you thought. 
but those things will leave you wanting. That's what he's saying. So, in other words, you get his love, you get his comfort, you get his presence, you get his contentment, and more and more. So, let me shift. There is a significant diabolical movement in Christian circles today. Yes, someone's nodding their head. Yes, you know where I'm going with this. That takes this Mark chapter 10 passage and everything I just said and twists it. Twists it. It comes in different names. Sometimes it's called the health and wealth gospel movement. Other times it's called the prosperity gospel movement. But in all in all, it's a deception and it is not the true gospel. Here's what it teaches. Basically, their focus is primarily on material possessions, physical well-being, and success in this life. In the cult of prosperity, Gordon Fee writes, American Christianity is rapidly being infected by an insidious disease, the so-called wealth and health gospel. Dave, I know you know all about this. Although it, is, it has very little of the character of the true gospel in it, it, it it's, in its more brazen forms, it simply says, serve God and get rich. In its more respectable but pernicious forms, it builds $15 million cathedrals to the glory of affluent suburban Christianity. And you may have seen it or come into contact with it at one time or another on TV. It's rampant on TV, maybe on the radio, maybe in the actual church. I don't know, or a book you saw or read. But it's out there and it's everywhere. Using, now listen, here's an example. I'm not going to name the preacher. I'm not going to name the preacher, but using this exact verse, Mark chapter 10. Here's what he said. Uh, you give $1 for the gospel's sake and $100 belongs to you. Give $10 and you'll receive $1,000. Give $1,000 and you'll receive $100,000. I know that you can multiply, but I want you to see it in black and white and see how tremendous the hundredfold return is. Give one house and you'll get 100 Give one house worth 100 and, and you'll give 100, get back 100 times more. Give one airplane. Really? Give one airplane and receive 100 times the value of the airplane. Give one car and the return would furnish you a lifetime of cars. In short, Mark 10.30 is a very good deal. What? That's what's being preached and taught. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you've come across that, do not buy that. Because that is not what Jesus was saying. It's been twisted. This good deal, <laughs> like a business deal of Mark chapter 10, verse 30, is referred to as prosperity gospel. And, and it has this law that it's you have to have faith to claim it. Now listen, listen to me. The way it's spun is if you are not rich and successful and doing thriving in this life, it's only your fault. Because, because God wants to bless you, but you don't have enough faith. And you must he must not love you because... You being rich is a sign of his blessing, and that's why you're not rich, because he must not like you or you've done something bad. Hogwash. That is not the teaching of Scripture. That is not what Scripture teaches. So do not buy that if you hear somebody saying that to you. Okay? That your problem is you don't have enough faith. No? No. Ultimately, uh, they're way off. There's many things wrong here with this kind of teaching, among them is that it goes contrary to what Jesus teaches, actually. And what Jesus teaches is that we are to, if we follow him, we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. And what that means is that we deny the world, we deny our own will, and follow his will first. But prosperity gospel flips that and basically says, it's all about you. And me, 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 me. I want to get rich. I got to have possessions. I got to have this. I got to have that. It's all about you. That's what this is saying. And that's actually not correct. It's always about God first. And so, I, I got a quote here. I'll just read it. Uh, this comes from John Piper. The, in the prosperity gospel, it is a false gospel, and their God is wealth and success. But here's what he says, uh, how he feels. He's a famous preacher out of Minnesota. And he states this, now these are his words that I'm quoting, okay? 
you're going to see they're pretty strong words. Very well-known preacher. He's written books and is on radio and all that. And on the internet. Here's what he says. I don't know what you feel about prosperity gospel, but I'll tell you what I feel about it. Hatred. It is not the gospel. It is being exported from this country to Africa and Asia, selling a bill of goods to the poorest of the poor. Believe this message and your pigs won't die, and your wife won't have miscarriages, and you'll have rings on your fingers and coats on your back. That's coming out of America. And people who ought to be giving our money, our time, and our lives, instead selling them a bunch of garbage called gospel. When was the last time any American, African, or Asian ever said Jesus is all satisfied because you drive a BMW? Never. <laughs> They'll say, well, did Jesus give you that? Yeah, he did. Well, I'll take Jesus then. That's idolatry and not the gospel. That's elevating the gifts above the giver. I'll tell you what makes Jesus look beautiful. It's when you smash your car and your little girl, unfortunately, goes flying out of that car through the windshield and lands dead. And you say in the deepest possible grief and pain, God is enough, God is enough, God is good, he's going to take care of us, he will get us through this, he is our treasure, whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth there is nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart and indeed even my little girl may pass, but you are eternal and you are the strength of my heart and you are the portion forever that makes that makes God look glorious as God, not the giver of cars or safety or health. He's not a cosmic Santa Claus or an ATM, but the sovereign Lord God. So, as a Christian, <laughs> now let me pivot back. Uh, as a Christian, you may be asking Peter's question. Okay, so I'm following you, Jesus. What then? What then? There's the question, and we've been exploring it this morning. What is my reward for rejecting the things of this world? Again, he reinforced what he said. He said, number one, a hundredfold blessing in this life. We, I hope, now understand what he meant by that. Not that you're going to get... You know, a hundred cars out there. That's ridiculous. Okay? I hope he gives you a hundred cars, but don't be thinking that was a promise that that's the case. Okay? Uh, number two, persecution. And number three, big one, eternal life. Eternal life. Ultimately, all this points to us to the greatest reward. And that is God himself. God himself and his love. Because we could have a hundredfold blessings, but it would be empty to us if we did not have the giver of the gifts. And that is God. So, listen to the words like the starry-eyed lover, King David, when he wrote these words to God. Oh God, you are my God, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with my joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Let me ask you a question. That's David, a man after God's own heart. Let me ask you a question. Is that this morning how you feel? Can you say these words with David? what he just wrote. That's pretty passionate. That's like, that's like a guy writing a, a poem to his, his, his love, right? Or, or vice versa, a girl writing a love poem to, right? That's how it sounds. Is that how you feel? Today about the God who's giving you and promising you all these things when you follow him? Do a gut check, guys. Do an assessment of where you are right now before God. Do you want him like that right now? Do you long for him? Well, the reward Christ ultimately speaks of and makes possible is something that is even better than what David expresses here. And that is this, that behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. No longer will there be anything accursed. 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. The greatest thing, ultimately, that David expressed is fulfilled in this, and that is that we will be with God, and we will see him face to face. That this world and all the things we thought would satisfy us in this world will give way to the real satisfaction and joy. And that is to be in the presence of God. Together, in the presence of God. And shall be able to hear from him and see him face to face. That is the greatest gift and reward that comes for the follower of Christ. God is the prize. God is the prize. So this morning, do you really want that? Gut check. Is that what I'm living for? Or am I living for the next meal? Am I living for the next paycheck? Am I living for the next bingo game? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Am I living for, or is it actually for the living God? who's going to renew every single one of us one day. Hey, these things, gone. We will be healthy and strong and young again. In Him. In Him. Do you long for that? Him. Him. That is what He will do. All right, join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for this word today, and we thank you for your love and goodness to us. Father, we pray that you give us faithful hearts to desire you, to love you, the way we see David talking about. Why? Because, Lord, you are God, and you have given us your love and salvation and made a way when we had turned away from you. You've made a way back, and you promised all of this goodness to us. What better is there than you? What, we have nothing greater than you. Our hope and our satisfaction lies in you alone. And so, Father, we pray for that promise to become that living hope that springs in us to action, to serve you, to worship you, to love you all the more every day. As passionate lovers of you, we pray all this in the name of Christ and for his glory and sake. Amen. Amen? All right. Receive the benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>